very much, and I appreciate you all being here, and I hope that uh, the talk will meet some of your needs in terms of information about working with Latino caregivers. So probably the first couple of slides, you already know a lot of this information that the prevalence of dementia in the U.S. is age-related and more common among people over 85. This slide shows you that if you're above 75, you also have a pretty high likelihood. So when you combine the 75 and the 85 plus, you're up to about 80% of those with Alzheimer's. So the age at which the disease is showing itself is, typically, is being pushed back further and further, partly because people are living longer. The expected growth in the population, where what we expect to see the increase, and this is globally, not only in the United States, not only in California, is in that 85 plus age group. Uh, but the, uh, that's the gold band on top. Uh, the blue band in the middle is the 75 plus. So again, the, those two ages comprise the largest uh, segment of the population with, um, with Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. Now, since our focus today is on Latinos, uh, we have to realize that, that the use of that term is um, very uh, loose most of the time because really what we're referring to are diverse groups or subgroups within that categorization. So most people think it's important to disaggregate that term and to actually find out a lot more about the particular person that you're working with or group if you're doing research because just because people share the Spanish language does not mean that they share cultures, their cultural beliefs or values or practices. And there are different rates of dementia in different subgroups. So we're not gonna go into all the details of that, but I just wanna point out to you that here in the United States, uh, we have representatives of, from Mexico, from Puerto Rico, from Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Central America, so countries like Guatemala, and South America. And if you look across the top with the total, you see that in general, their poverty is fairly common at about 20%, high levels of disability, rough 40%, roughly slight variations, uh, living alone, roughly 20% again, uh, less than nine years of education is probably the one that's most striking to people uh, because we don't think about that. But if you look at the Puerto Rican group, it's 65%, Mexican group 52%, uh, Dominican group 60. I mean, these are very high proportions of people with limited education. And this we have to really take into account in working with individuals. And then the last column uh, speaks little or no English. Um, so this can really present challenges for care and as well as for research. So all that said, I'm nevertheless going to talk for a moment about Latinos um, because that's the way most of the research is reported. Uh, so we find that in the US, the Latinos are about one and a half times more likely to have Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia compared to non-Hispanics. And the diagnosis is more often missed in this group. So other diagnoses are given and the dementia diagnosis seems to uh, be very unpopular, shall we say. But in California, we've got a tremendous uh, talent ahead because the number, the actual sheer number of Latinos living with Alzheimer's is expected to triple by the year 2030. Uh, that's huge. And the risk is higher for people with certain characteristics. So in California, the predominant group, at least uh, the, the largest group that's been studied, I shouldn't say it's the predominant group, but it's the largest group that's been studied, are Mexican-American. And um, a lot of this information is based on those particular studies. So we see, first of all, the uh, dementia we know is age-related. In Latinos, the average life expectancy is going to go up to age 87. And we saw two graphs that showed that that's exactly the range that where the prevalence of dementia is greater than in younger age groups. We said levels of formal education are low. I showed you that a moment ago. Um, 
in addition, specific risk factors, type 2 diabetes and poorly controlled hypertension, increase the risk, particularly for vascular types of dementia. And there's underutilization of existing services so that the diagnosis, as I mentioned too, is put off, uh, and uh, oftentimes until the person is in the middle or later stages. So the, the study uh, upon which most of that information is based was called the SALSA study, which was carried out right here uh, by uh, researchers at uh, UC Davis. Uh, and uh, all were, so they went to get a community sample of Mexican Americans, 60 years of age and older, who weren't showing any particular cognitive symptoms or risk of dementia, risk, dementia symptoms at the beginning. But they were followed over time. And the prevalence of dementia was found to be overall around 5%. That's when you look at 60 plus, the entire group. But when you look at that 85 plus group, you find much higher, close to 20% in women and over 20% in men. So you see uh, the same trend, the older you get, the more likely, but a little, bit, uh, a little bit of a gender difference there. And that's interesting because most other studies with non-Hispanic whites find that women have a higher prevalence. So this is one of the few to show that it's roughly equal, maybe a little more for men, and partly that was because they uh, very carefully sampled to have enough men in the study and followed them over time. The specific risk factors that they identified are the ones you see here, older age we mentioned, education we talked about, early socioeconomic disadvantage, that's a new one, and that seems to be particularly true of Latinos, not other groups that have been studied. Um, uncontrolled or poorly controlled type 2 diabetes. Uh, if there has actually been a stroke, uh, then that is an independent risk factor. And then the APO4 allele, probably most of you know about that, that if you have uh, one copy of the APO4E allele, your, the risk is slightly greater. If you have two copies, it's considerably greater. And in Latinos, this was very noticeable. So when there were two copies of the E4 allele, plus any of these other risk factors, um, the percentages were higher. So like I said, the most valuable, most reliable information we have is on Mexican Americans. But we don't know that that really generalizes to all those other groups. So Cuban Americans have not been carefully studied. Um, there was one study in New York of uh, Puerto Ricans and that found much higher rates of Alzheimer's than the Mexican-American study did. And that was attributed to the low, generally low education of the group, but who knows. Um, and that's about it. So people from Central America, South America, Dominican Republic, they have not really been studied. So we honestly don't know. I mentioned again, and I want to emphasize here, the subgroup differences. There are differences in culture, in values, religion. Not all Latinos are Catholic, um, commonly held misconception. Uh, the dialects that are spoken, sometimes it is difficult for someone who's Mexican in background to understand someone who's speaking, uh, who's Puerto Rican in background because of differences, even though Spanish is the same language but differences in the kinds of words that are used and in the rate of pronunciation and so forth. And we've mentioned education as an issue. But something that, that all the Latino groups seem to have in common is the family structure, which uh, is somewhat, which is definitely different than non-Hispanic whites. So multiple generations often live in the same roof, under the same roof. Um, the emphasis is on the family, la familia, not the individual. So it's much more of a collectivist orientation. So what benefits the family is what's considered valuable, and what does not, what will, what will uh, reflect poorly on the family, is uh, considered really taboo and very carefully avoided. Uh, the grandparents, the compadrazos, play an important role and often take on a caregiver role for younger people in the family, which is why when the grandparent, who's typically the one over 80, right, develops the dementia symptoms, it seems to be so hard for the family to seek help because in doing so, they lose 
the, the role that that grandparent played. It, if it was a, a meaningful role in raising the children, keeping the household going, and that sort of thing, while the caregiver is working, which is typically the case, there's a reluctance to acknowledge the problem because then that means that all that goes with it is going to change uh, radically. Cultural beliefs, a uh, number of studies have shown that um, among Latinos, this is again the current cohort of Latinos, um, and primarily the information is based on Mexican Americans, so you have to be mindful of that as I go along. Uh, but the studies that have been done show that the majority of Latinos do not view dementia as a disease. It is not regarded as a disease. It is regarded as normal aging for the most part. Um, or it can be due to locura, nervios. It can be considered a punishment uh, from God for sins. Some studies have found stress in earlier life particularly the stress of, of immigration. Uh, seem, that's a belief that that precipitates Alzheimer's, family tragedies, and a lack of social support. So these are very different views than the views that are held by the non-Hispanic white uh, population who clearly view dementia as a, as a disease. Um, so if you don't think dementia is a disease, you're not going to go to the doctor for help, right? If you don't think that that's what's going on, but you think it's, it's attributable to some of these other things, then you're going to seek help differently than someone who thinks it's a disease and we ought to go to the doctor. So where uh, the traditional sources of help are the curanderas and the espirit, espirit, espiritistas. Did I say that right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so the, uh, the herbal healers and the spiritual healers, that's where people often go first. So herbal and dietary remedies, you see their um, peppers, for example, are considered to be very uh, cleansing of the body and therefore they will help to rebalance the body. And so that's probably a fact that's thought to be an important factor other herbs that are uh, tried out by the different curanderos according to their, um, you might say, private remedies or secret remedies. These are not generally well known, um, but they are very much practiced in this region. Uh, traditional healing, or going to the spiritual leader, the espiritistas, uh, that can be through the church, some of these things that you see here, prayer, lighting candles, saying a rosary, wearing a scapular uh, necklace for a blessing or protection. These can, are thought to help greatly. So what happens is that when these things don't work, so perhaps they do work in the early stages, but at a certain point they don't really work because the behavior problems continue and they get worse. We all know that um, behavior problems are the single most important thing that, that um, encourage families to seek help, no matter what their ethnicity or, or race or background. It's behavior problems that gets you in the door. Um, so when these things uh, have run their course, then people might seek help in the medical establishment. But um, I think, and most people who work in this field uh, with Latinos think that we need to educate the Latino families more about what are some of the risks associated with caregiving uh, when, it, when there is no support. When the caregiving is done over a long period of time, the individual oftentimes doesn't realize that they are caregiving. There is no word. There is no directly translatable word in the Spanish language for caregiver. Uh, generally, the word uh, that's used uh, has to do with helpful person, someone who is a helpful person, uh, provides help, cuidar. But it, there is no direct translation. So families provide the care over time until it gets so bad that they can't manage the individual anymore. Then they seek help perhaps for the person with dementia, but all the while, these things are going on in them. Uh, the data that we have, again, primarily Mexican-American, primarily from California, some from Texas, 
a little bit of research in Florida with the Cuban population there shows that the health risks associated with dementia caregiving are the same. They are universal across groups. This is true in Spanish speaking, in Chinese speaking, Japanese, Farsi speaking. There are a number of other cultural groups that have been studied. Again, I'm focusing on Latinos. But these risks or negative outcomes of caregiving seem to be universal, irregardless of race and ethnicity. So a big one is the compromised immune system for the caregiver. This means that if the caregiver gets a cold, which, you know, how can we avoid that, right? Or you get the flu, or you get some other infection more serious than a cold or a flu, your immune system is going to drag. It's going to take longer to cure that infection or that cold or that flu. Uh, it's simply going to take longer. And over time, when you have a, con a continuous um, insult to the immune system, you become susceptible to other diseases as well. And how do we know that? We know that because the studies uh, that have used cortisol as a marker of stress have found that uh, the dysregulated cortisol, so cortisol that does not follow a normal pattern. Normal pattern is it rises in the morning, it's, it's high in the morning, helps you get motivated. Cortisol is, you might think of like the adrenaline surge. You know, you get up and get going. Um, and during the day, the cortisol level drops. Uh, it's supposed to drop, and then by the evening, it's much lower. That's the normal pattern, so that you're able to rest. If you were having a high, sustained level of cortisol circulating in the bloodstream, you would not be able to sleep very well. You would always feel kind of revved up and kind of on, and uh, over time, again, that seems to be the link to, the, uh, to weakening the immune system further. So these are some physical health outcomes that have been shown in the, in the research. Mental health outcomes the, in the Latino research with Latinos, again, mainly Mexican-Americans, depression is the highest. Depression is the single most significant mental health, negative mental health outcome that's reported, uh, followed by anxiety, anger, frustration, and guilt, pretty much in that order. Um, so those are important in all groups, but depression is very high in Latinos. Most studies find that at least 50% of those interviewed or given self-report measures to fill out are at a threshold, above threshold, for a clinical level of depression. Not just every day, the blues, but a clinical level of depression. Um, I just had a quick question, I hate to interrupt, but is yes. this specifically looking at Latinos living in the U.S., or is, was yeah, there a compared to the Latinos US. living in their own country? No, in the okay. U.S. There are no comparison studies okay. at the present time. Uh -huh. Like the Latinos in the U.S. versus Latinos in Mexico, for instance. Right, a Latino mm -hmm. that's dealing with an Alzheimer's mm -hmm. um, in the family that's living in their own country. Mm -hmm. um, as to how great they would handle that versus how they're handling it in the U.S. Mm -hmm. That would be great research to do. Hasn't been done yet. Uh, but that brings in another aspect of it that some of you might be interested in, the whole notion of acculturation, that um, individuals particularly who, uh, who immigrate to this country, um, and not only those, those who were born here as well into immigrant families, have issues with acculturation, with how are they dealing with the larger culture, how do they fit in or not fit in. Um, the different model, there are many different models of acculturation. Bicultural is what's considered most associated with good mental health. So someone who can navigate in both cultural worlds effectively. Um, how this, there's one study that's been done, it was actually a doctoral student of mine who looked at acculturation in Latino caregivers to see whether or not it made a difference in the mental health outcomes, mm -hmm. and, it, and it did. Those who were less highly acculturated had better mental health outcomes. As a caregiver. As caregivers, the caregiver. Mm -hmm. so they were less yeah, less that. highly acculturated. That so they, they held mean. more to the traditional values the traditional beliefs about dementia and the traditional values and they of, have less of the family. Stress than less stress. Okay. Mm -hmm. The more highly acculturated were uh, described themselves as being very torn 
between what they saw as ways to get ahead in society, ways to make success for themselves and their families, versus taking care of the aging parent, which would be the traditional view, right? The traditional view of the many multiple generations under one roof, the family is the unit, not the individual. So the more highly acculturated are experiencing conflict between the desire to succeed in this society versus these older values or traditional values that say the family comes first, not the individual. Therefore, you should be home taking care of mom or grandma or father or father-in-law. Does that make sense? That's the conflict. OK, so let me move on. Um, so the, comp the model that's generally used to understand caregiver stress is called the stress process model, uh, where you differentiate between primary stressors, the actual time spent in caregiving, the type of care that's provided, um, and the symptoms of the person with dementia. What are they showing that's really getting on the nerves of the person who is caring? Secondary stressors, their role strain, most Latino caregivers are middle-aged women. They're generally, and middle-aged broadly construed, between uh, 40 and 60. And they generally are employed outside the home. Some have more than one job. They generally have children in the home, uh, oftentimes a husband who's working as well, and multiple generations. So then you've got the grandparent or the parent and the, uh, perhaps the spouse of that parent, depending how many people there are with these cognitive problems. Uh, the money involved in caring for a person with dementia can also be a real strain for many Latinos who are, um, many live close to the poverty line. But what's good about this model is that it looks not only at the stressors, but it looks at the buffering resources that the individual might have. So some of those are within the person, like their personality, you might say. Some people always see the glass as half empty, right? They're very pessimistic people. No matter what you do, they always have kind of have that downer view of things. Other people tend to be optimistic, you know, yeah, I can handle it and they've been that way since they were little. So it's kind of, that's a personality factor. Um, others have a, a large support network, and having a large support network is a buffer because you have other people that can help. But in the research on Latino families, what's been found is that even though there are many multiple family members either in the same household or nearby or you know pretty close, they don't necessarily help out and the role of primary caregiver is still there. One person is the primary caregiver, and that's usually the eldest daughter. Um, and that person has the primary responsibility, even though there are others around. So social support, if it's utilized, can be very helpful. But just having a large network is not in itself helpful. Uh, cultural context, this degree of push-pull between the uh, being highly acculturated or bicultural versus maintaining traditional values. And then finally, coping styles, mechanisms, methods of coping. Most of the successful research uh, or research that has been successful with Latino family caregivers is based on this stress process model and the notion of building up the coping strategies, helping the person realize they have more options, helping them realize what some other coping strategies are that they may not have used um, before, they may not even know about. So in the following, I'll present some studies completed and ongoing um, that have been successful. So there's REACH 1 project, the REACH 2, the Savvy Caregiver Program, the Photo Novella Program, uh, reaching out in San Diego, which I actually don't have time to talk about today, but if you're interested, you can ask me after, and then Mirella or the, the Web Novella Project. So there's quite a few of them, and uh, I'm assuming that probably most of you are not that familiar with them, so I wanted to put them all in one talk. So the Coping with Caregiving Program uh, underlies both REACH 1 and REACH 2, and that's a program that 
uh, I developed along with colleagues at Stanford and at the Palo Alto VA, but also in the community. We had a community um, presence, uh, individuals from, uh, we had an advisory board, which I've maintained for probably 15 years, of individuals from many different geographic areas around the Bay uh, that have large Latino populations. So closest to where I am in Palo Alto is Redwood City. Um, next would be San Jose. Uh, next would be Watsonville. Next would be Hollister. After that is Salinas. Uh, so down in that Monterey region. So we've tended to go south uh, because other, other groups have gone further north, though there are many Latino groups north as well, Santa Rosa, many of the agriculture areas, and certainly here in the valley and you know, where UC Davis has done its work. So we've gone south down into Salinas, as far as Salinas, and over the years have conducted 11 different studies um, randomized trials and the one community-based demonstration project in San Diego. And of those, we've had about close to a thousand uh, Latino caregivers participate from all of these different regions and the other numbers there, as you can see. And the, in the randomized trial, we compare this coping with caregiving or development of coping skills approach to some of these control conditions. And generally, we see an improvement in what we, what we hope to see, namely <coughs> less depression, because I mentioned depression was the psychological uh, stress that people report most. So less depression if the skills are learned. So in some of these studies, we looked at the moderator effect of actually learning skills and using them, as opposed to simply just reporting less or more depression. But what was influencing that and it seemed to be that it was learning the skill in the first place and then using it in their daily lives. That was an important moderator. So people can attend something like this, a coping skill training program, and not really learn. And in that case, the depression doesn't change. Um, and also stress. So uh, to measure the depression, we use the CESD scale. That's the most commonly used for, uh, in caregiver research throughout the United States, and there are very good translations in different versions of Spanish, so Mexican Spanish, Cuban Spanish, Puerto Rican Spanish, um, that exist. <clears throat> and the CESD is free, free and downloadable, so it can be used uh, widely. Uh, to measure stress, we use the memory and behavior problem checklist. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Linda Terry developed. Uh, it has a list of common memory and behavior problems and it asks the person how often do they occur and how much do they bother you when they occur. And we found that there are people who have problems that occur virtually every day, but they don't report stress. Those are the optimistic ones, you know, the ones who are, have, you might have, you might say have resilience or, you know, somehow the personality style that no matter what hits them, they're pretty able to uh, roll with the punches. And there are other people who report relatively infrequent occurrence of a particular behavior, but it really bothers them when it occurs. Right? So we're looking at stress here as the self-reported, how much does it bother you? And generally, um, people report less stress at the end. And again, what is that related to? It's related to whether or not they are using the skills, applying those skills to the behaviors that are bother that were bothering them at the beginning. So we looked individually for change. So what is this program? So this Coping with Caregiving program uh, originally was designed as 12 small group sessions. We now have it down to six, and we're actually pilot testing a four session version of it uh, right now. And I think that's gonna be effective because um, people are always worried about time, right? How are they gonna find the time to do these kinds of things? So this one is in person, uh, six to 10 people, um, structured manual, manual in English and Spanish, and uses active participation to learn the skills, role play, feedback, that kind of thing, home practice in between, um, 
And these are the kinds of skills that we focus on. The first of five, four, one, two, three, four. The first four are the ones that I would say have really worked the best. The last one, planning for the future, is the least uh, well accepted by Latinos. It's very well accepted in the non-Hispanic white group. Everybody wants to plan for the future, know about advanced health care directives, you know, living will, durable power of attorney, all those kind of things. Not, whoops, <laughs> close, uh oh, <laughs> close, uh oh, close the window, there we go. Okay, um, so we are not emphasizing that one anymore. Behavior management, so, you know, dealing with some of the uh, unpleasant behaviors that occur. Um, we use that ABC model, antecedent behavior consequence. I'm sure many of you know that one. We also teach relaxation techniques uh, every meeting because we find that if the caregivers are calm, they're a lot more able uh, to deal with things than if they're stressed. A very obvious point, but a lot of people don't know simple relaxation techniques. Um, thinking, how to change, how to, how to modify unhelpful thinking patterns. Uh, communicating more effectively, especially asking for help from that large family network, and increasing positive activities. So for Latino caregivers, some basic modifications we made. One is we don't, in the non-Hispanic whites, we always started with homework review. What did you do since last time? And we had the high you know, structure and all that, and on the board, how many minutes each thing was gonna take. Uh, that doesn't work with Latinos. They want to come and talk. Uh, so it's the term platicar, socialization. Uh, developing the relationship is the first and foremost. Before you can teach anything, you have to have the relationship. And in non-Latino way, non-Hispanic way, that's not the case. Um, very important. So if the meeting is supposed to start at 10, we get there at 9.30 and encourage people to come you know, as early as they can. Everyone brings food. We share the food. Uh, we talk for a while. And then when it's 10, then we start the actual uh, didactic portion in the workshop. Uh, and some other modifications. Uh, many caregivers, for example, uh, find, uh, found it extremely difficult to work on communication because they didn't feel that they were allowed to express themselves or to ask for help, that that would really reflect poorly on them. It's their job to take care of the parent or the parent-in-law. If you say you need help, then that means there's something wrong with you. So uh, it, that was a delicate one to deal with, um, but we found that by encouraging the caregiver to ask permission first, to speak, to express themselves, to ask for help, it seemed to make the whole process go a lot better. We engaged other family members. Again, with the non-Hispanic white, you rarely would do that. Uh, most of the time, there aren't any other family members to engage, except that live far away, typically. With the Latinos, uh, how to engage the family members, calling them, uh, offering them an opportunity to attend the class with the primary caregiver so that they could learn too. That was the final uh, solution to that one, you might say, um, involving the family members to attend. So the first project, I won't go through it, I've already talked about that, but one thing important is one year follow-up showed that the gains were maintained in both groups. One year follow-up, so that I think that's pretty good. <laughs> um, and here's a case example that I wanted to talk about of how this actually works. So we have Anna, who's 45, and she's uh, kind of typical, as I described before, children in the home, younger children, works outside the home, taking care of her mother. She's had, uh, quote, memory problems. And uh, the mother, Maria, is physically healthy, but she doesn't remember to take her, uh, her medications uh, that she has for diabetes and hypertension. She's considered to be relatively stable when she takes the medications. But when she doesn't take the medications, then there are problems. And she's often confused about where she is and what she's supposed to be doing. So Anna's been more nervous about leaving her in charge of the kids uh, when, she, when Anna is at work. And she reports moderately stressed. This is a true case, a true case example, uh, particularly when the mother repeats things over and over. 
So just illustrating the behavior change piece of it, uh, we look for the triggers or the antecedents, right? What is it that comes before um, that seems to trigger the repeated questioning? And it seemed to be boredom. And also perhaps the mother wanting some attention from Anna, who is always busy and kind of impatient. And then the group uh, helped to identify some reactions of Anna's that may be making the situation worse. So Anna would answer, would always answer the question with an accurate answer instead of um, coming up with something else that might be more soothing all the way around. Or she often would just lose it kind of and, and say, you know, I just told you, I just answered that. Why are you asking me that again? And, and become very obviously frustrated, uh, which in turn uh, made the mother more, fl uh, more uh, flustered and agitated. So what did the group come up with? The group comes up with ideas about changing the triggers, right? Help Anna, uh, help, help uh, Maria become more engaged in things. Maybe she needs activities. Uh, maybe she really is bored, let's see. Uh, perhaps if you post a calendar, she could refer to that and that would maybe help her ask less frequently. But the important, another important thing was that Anna changed her reaction so and she used distraction techniques, in trying to engage the mother in doing something else, and she did mindful breathing um, before answering. So rather than answering questions with, a, with an accurate answer, she would breathe deeply and then try to engage the mother in an activity. And this promoted a lot more harmony in the household. These are some other things that she did, worked on her thoughts, Increase positive activities and so forth, but they didn't. They were important, but it seemed like the behavior um, behavior change was more important. And at the end of the of the group, well, that was at the time when we were doing uh, eight session groups. This example comes from. Uh, she felt that she was taking better care of her mother and of herself, and more confident, and she felt less guilty. This was something she came up with on her own that she felt like she was doing what she could do uh, for the sake of her mother and her whole family. Uh, and she didn't feel like she was supposed to be doing more, which uh, had been something that had really been bothering her for some time. So it's an example of the power of the group, because Anna, on her own, could not come up with these things. They're not uh, you know, terribly, they're not rocket science, right? But on her own, she was too stressed to be able to really think of them. But prompted by the group and encouraged by their experiences, what they, what they found worked, uh, she was able to try some new things. So with Latino caregivers, we think the power of the group is really important and uh, probably has its own impact, uh, you know, a positive impact in and of itself. So we have, as I say, the English and Spanish versions, and then we also have the, uh, the program translated into Chinese, Japanese, and Farsi. If any of you are interested in, in that, you should contact me because I'm happy to share the materials. So that was all regarding the first early studies, then REACH 2, the main publication of REACH 2 was in 2006, and there have been a number of follow-ups since then. That's the largest one done in this country to date, and it's not that large. 650 is the sample size, uh, roughly evenly divided among those three groups. Five sites, including Palo Alto. Um, it was a very labor-intensive program. Ten home visits, plus phone-based support over six months. It incorporated some features, though, of the coping with caregiving. It incorporated the positive activities. It incorporated the behavior change. Um, so it built on what we, what we had already developed and shown was effective. And there was a, a control condition, which was just one phone call. And there was significant improvement over time. The greatest improvement was found in the Latinos, the highly statistically significant improvement over time compared to the um, non-Hispanic white, and the African-American showed the least improvement. So there have been a number of follow-up studies trying to go into that more deeply and find out why that was the case. 
So I hope from, from that discussion we get an idea that skill training helps. It really works. It helps reduce depression. It reduces stress associated with memory and behavior problems. It helps to improve the quality of life, reported quality of life of the caregiver. Now, another program that has a lot of similarities is called the Savvy Caregiver Program. This one uh, is 12 hours of training. They're also trying to shorten it. It's available in English and Spanish. And uh, besides having the detailed trainer's manual that, we, that I showed you that we have in Coping with Caregiving, they also have a caregiver manual, a training videotape, and a CD-ROM. So they made use of some other media to get their ideas across. And this one was developed um, originally in Minnesota and uh, tested there. So that's a rural population, and you might say, well, you know, that's a little bit different maybe than the population that uh, we deal with in urban settings, but it's been replicated in several other places, and the findings, again, are fairly robust. Uh, and recently, it was uh, tested in Texas with the Latinos in Texas, uh, like primarily Mexican in background in Texas, and similar uh, results were found. Um, in terms of the outcome measures, which again are very comparable to what I showed you for the REACH project. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association has picked up on the Savvy Caregiver Program, and they have been applying it in different uh, regions in California. And the uh, website, the last one, uh, last line there, the website gives you access to that program if you're not familiar with the Savvy Caregiver Program. So that might be another one that you might want to look into. So reach one, reach two, now we're on the third one, Savvy Caregiver. Now let me talk about the fourth one, the fotonovela. So the fotonovela is um, like a comic book, but I'm not saying that pejoratively, but I'm, I want to emphasize that it uses pictures, colors, bright colors, it tells a story, it's very dynamic, um, and it's appealing. So. Real actors were used to illustrate key points. Um, the content was based on 12 focus groups that we conducted. Uh, we were a little nervous about going into this, a different media for presenting information, different method, or, um, because I mentioned not three minutes ago that the power of the group was really important with Latina caregivers, right? So we didn't know if producing something like this, a book, would have anywhere near the same impact, right? Or what impact would it have? But the focus groups said we should try it, and they gave us a lot of good ideas about content. So this is it. It's called uh, Together We Can, Facing Memory Loss as a Family. Uh, it's in English and Spanish. It's uh, 16 pages in English and 16 pages in Spanish. So we found uh, our focus group participants told us that was very important because not all Latinos speak Spanish or read Spanish, especially not the younger generation. Uh, they may not be able to uh, really get the most out of it if it's only in Spanish. So Spanish and English. And uh, it's a, the story of the Jimenez family, and it tells a little bit about getting the diagnosis, what were some of the trigger behaviors that led the family to think something was wrong. And one was burning things on the stove, um, because th this was from a woman who loved to cook, and often cooked for the family, and so the, the obvious decline in her function was when she could no longer cook effectively for the family, because she kept burning things or making, mixing up the recipes, you know, putting things together that didn't belong together, so creating meals that were not edible to the family. So it was at that point that they wanted some help, and, uh, that and she became more confused. So that's the storyline, and use, it shows how distraction can be effectively used, what kind, how you can get help from other family members, and also a daycare center that have, you know, in this fictional book, it happened to be there, which is really nice if they happen to have, if you happen to have one in your vicinity. Uh, of course, if that's, com that's comfortable for Spanish-speaking individuals, then that would be a wonderful referral. 
Um, so we put that in there. And we had a family meeting, which was very important for bringing in the not quite on board brother who thought the whole thing was being, uh, you know, over, overly dramatized uh, by the caregiver. And it really wasn't all that bad. Of course, he had never had to take care of her, so, you know. And we also had a depression checklist included because I said depression was the most important mental health problem. So the depression checklist is in the book and it says if you score above a certain number on this checklist, see your doctor because you have a you have a problem that's probably interfering with your ability to be a good caregiver and you should get help for your depression. So what happened with that? Well, we conducted a randomized trial and we found that there was a, a significant decrease in depression in those who had the fotonovela compared to the control condition. The control condition was existing educational materials in Spanish provided by the Alzheimer's Association and uh, a website called ADIR, which is supported by the National Institute on Aging. So between those sources, we, pro we provided them the information. So we either, they either got the fotonovela or they got these other educational materials in English and Spanish. And that was the comparison. Very interesting finding was, contrary to some of the prior studies that I talked about, there was no difference in stress. So that they both changed comparably. The lines were parallel. So what it means is that providing the education material, even the usual education material, not the culturally tailored fotonovela, did benefit some caregivers. And that tells you that there's such a, a crying need for information, give, be accurate information being given to the Latino community, and that information in and of itself is beneficial. Though, if you're looking for change in depression, you might want to try something that's much more culturally tailored, like the fotonovela. Um, then, another project that I was involved in, we developed, this is one of the first online programs for caregivers. It's called I Care Family. Uh, the website is icarefamily.com. It's i little i icarefamily.com, and it is um, the trial is over now. It is freely accessible to the public. You go to the website and uh, you see that there are a number of videos. So we incorporated some of the ideas from Savvy Caregiving by creating videos. Um, that illustrated, <clears throat> with actors again, that illustrated uh, less adaptive ways to respond to a situation, you know, poor, poor coping, and then better coping. So the actors acted them out with a commentary. It's a very good program. We conducted a randomized trial on that. Um, and uh, for those who didn't have a computer, we provided it on DVD. Um, explain on the outcome. Uh, let me just go to the results. So the change was in stress. So different from the fotonovela. Fotonovela, the change was in depression, not stress. Eye care changes in stress, not depression. The opposite. Okay. So why was that? Well, we think partly, I'm sorry? Ten. Ten. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. We think partly <clears throat> because this one is so individual, it's so um, isolating, okay, it's kind of isolating, right? You can go to your computer or watch your DVD, whatever you want to, but you might do it in the middle of the night, right, because your, your immune system is probably not working that well, and so you've got too much cortisol, so you're not sleeping, so maybe you access it by yourself, alone, and odd hours. It, with the with the fotonovela, uh, people reported sharing it with the family members. They really liked having the book and sharing it. This was not something that was reported to be shared, it, uh, and it's only in English. I should say that this was the the original program of I Care is only in English, so it was um, you know therefore less available to many Latinos. And we had an issue with dropouts. Roughly one third of those who enrolled originally dropped out before completing the program. And that's similar to other online interventions, but still not good, you know, so we're trying to address that. 
And here's what we are addressing it with now, which is Proyecto Mirella. So Mirella is a three-year project funded by the National Institute on Aging. And we've created a telenovela, completely in Spanish, 18 episodes. It's actually shorter than that. They're about they're 10 to 15 minutes maximum. And it's a story of the family. Uh, Mirella is the primary caregiver taking care of Maribel, her mother. Okay, so this is the plot of Mirella, the Lopez family. So we have uh, Maribel, the individual with the symptoms, um, then uh, Mirella, her daughter, and Mario, the husband of the daughter, so her son-in-law, then her oldest granddaughter, Gracia, next granddaughter, Esperanza, Gracia's boyfriend, Romero, he adds quite a bit of interest to the plot, I should tell you, and Mirella's brother, Luis, Jose Luis, who's in Arizona, but comes and goes and tells him what to do when he comes and goes. Um, so the storyline is that uh, she's developing more and more problems, um, Maddie Bell, and the family is experiencing conflict, and they struggle with these difficult situations. You know, they're, they, uh, there's a lot of discussion back and forth. What should we do? How should we handle it? Uh, they sort out the issues by using some of the techniques that we teach them. So it's not only a soap opera, which would have perhaps appeal in itself, but it's an educational soap opera because at the beginning or the end of each clip, at the beginning and at the end, there's a discussion about here's what you're going to see, and then they see it, and then at the end, here's what we want you to remember, here's what we hope you've learned from seeing this. Okay. And at the end, um, it, it occurs over a period of like five years. Okay, so by the end, she's quite impaired, uh, Maddie Bell. And it shows that the family is learning to um, adapt. They're, they're realizing that she's never going to get better, uh, but that they need to cope with change as it occurs. So now I would like, it only takes a couple of minutes, can you help me, um, yeah, help me get this thing going. I'm just gonna show you very briefly one clip and uh, then that will be pretty much the end. I have one other resource to tell you about. In the back are the flyers for Mirella uh, and you're welcome, you're welcome to take as many as you wish. There's quite a few back there, and I hope you'll share them with your colleagues. After Mirella's mother has had some hallucinations, Mir by reading her a poem, Mirella turns a stressful situation into a pleasant activity. Después de que la madre de Mirela ha sufrido de algunas alucinaciones, Mirela le lee un poema a su madre para atenuar la situación estresante. Lúpido, mejor uno de sus cuentos, como los que me leía cuando fuera niña. Mirela no puede So literally, yesterday we opened the website. So you're the first group to hear about this, okay? Proyecto Mirella. And uh, the website is uh, www.mirella.com. There's an email, there's a phone number. The phone number is toll free, it's uh, responded to by a bilingual, uh, a, a bilingual uh, family care consultant, a gentleman who's very, uh, very sensitive, uh, and it's all in Spanish. If the person doesn't have a computer so that they uh, don't have access to the internet, the DVD will be sent to them. 
if they complete the project, they will earn $100 for completing the pre and the post testing, um, which is on again online or will be mailed to the individuals. Uh, and we would be happy for you to uh, ask ask me more about it or pick up those flyers and encourage families to call even if they're not sure they want to enroll they can call and uh, talk to Ernesto and find out more about the project that way there's no obligation and no cost to them um, so we have in addition the very last thing that I want to talk about is an opportunity for non-Spanish speaking caregivers uh, so I'm um, mentoring a group of uh, students at Stanford who are developing a mobile app for the smartphone, okay? This is, of course, going to be in English first because that's how you got to do things, you know, get them started anyway. And we want to find out, uh, believe it or not, there are no mobile apps for caregivers um, that have any evidence base behind them. There are a few out there, but there aren't any that were developed from a research context uh, as this one is being developed. So it's using the, all the information that I shared with you about the coping with caregiving program, but we're honing down on one particular aspect, which is increasing everyday positive activities. And we want to do that through the smartphone by um, finding out a little bit about people and their loved one, the person they're taking care of, like their hobbies, and past hobbies, things they used to enjoy, things they still enjoy and time of day when the stress is particularly high. And we hope to therefore develop individualized lists of recommendations for activities that they might do singly and together with the person with dementia and send them messages, push messages on the smartphone and see what that does and measure their stress before and after uh, the activities. So we're developing the prototype. If you want to, we have a very, very new website up. Uh, I think they just put this one up last night. Uh, it's www.informal.care. And this one is a, it's going to be updated regularly as we get more information. But if you want to volunteer, if you're a caregiver yourself and you want to volunteer to help us develop the prototype, or even if you're not a caregiver, uh, but you work with caregivers enough so you could uh, you know, get in the spirit of it, uh, we would welcome your participation. It's only by having a lot of people participate that we'll get the prototype down right. And uh, they are graduating in June, um, <laughs> and it's April, so we have to do this very quickly. Uh, so, so thank you for your attention. I know I'm sure I'm out of time. Uh, I would like to open up for questions. Uh, I, do, I think I have, have maybe... 10, 15 minutes for oh, questions. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Great. We have time for questions, so, but I will stop talking and I hope you will uh, comment or whatever. It doesn't have to be a question, it could be a comment. So, uh, yes? I take you home with me. <laughs> <laughs> my stepfather is Mexican-American and he married my mother almost 20 years ago. She's... Uh, 12 years older than him and has vascular dementia. His health is so poor now. Uh, he, he can't sleep. He's a worrier personality type anyway. Um, and I think this would be fabulous for him. Not only that, he, he's only got about 125 relatives in San Jose. <laughs> Two of them are his daughters who are living with his uh, second wife, my mother's his third wife. He's a nice guy. <laughs> But I, you know, sometimes it's hard for me to get him to even focus. Um, helping these overly stressed caregivers, he's lost 70 pounds in a year. He does not sleep, and he just lost his only son, who was only 55. So um, this kind of information is critical. It's it's so wonderful. Thank you. Oh, well, that's, thank you for sh thank you very much for sharing. It, it sounds like an incredibly difficult situation because it isn't it, it not just the caregiving but all these other things that you described. I mean, losing his son, losing his only son, must be a terrible blow uh, for the, for this man. Um, it well, sounds especially when you can't share it with your spouse. Yeah, because she absolutely, forgets. sure, as soon as you tell sure. Her. 
Well, my guess is that he's probably suffering from depression. He is depressed, and his doctor has only given him uh, drugs. You know, it's just that's the, unfortunately, if that's all you can do is get yourself to your doctor, you can't really even advocate for yourself. That's what you're going to end up with, and I worry about the psychotropic drugs. Mm -hmm. Is he taking an antidepressant medication? Yes. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like it's helping a lot. Well, it's since his body is so, you know, uh, his immune system, I'm sure, is very, mm -hmm. very low. So I'm hoping that he won't get ill mm -hmm. and be hospitalized himself. Yes. Well, you might ask the, the physician to reevaluate that medication. You know, there are many different kinds of antidepressants, and oftentimes it's a trial and error process till you find one that works. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, he certainly could be enrolling in, the, uh, or you could help him enroll possibly in Medella. Actually, I think I could probably help him more by telling him about this program to help his daughters. You know, he's, uh, he won't yes. help himself, but okay. he'll help other people. Mm -hmm. So sometimes. It would help the daughters, yeah. yeah he's a very mm -hmm. selfless person, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's a cultural factor also. He mm -hmm. would rather help someone else than yes. help himself. Yes, exactly. So that, uh, yes, different members of the same family can enroll. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter, and they don't have to be in this geographic area, right? So if you know someone who's in, in Texas or in Florida or some, or some other location, as long as they have either access to the internet or a DVD player, they could participate in the program. And I think to, it's, it, because it's entertaining, and we saw the, the photonovela was successful, so we're hoping that this, another form of entertainment, will be even more successful because it's longer, it's more engaging, and it's, it's very uh, true to life. The situations that they're dealing with are, are very real. You know, the, uh, the, the daughter, the granddaughters, and the boyfriend, and the other granddaughter in school who tells her classmates, you know, something happened to my grandma, I don't know what it is, I can't talk to her anymore. And they used to talk a lot, and they, grandma, you saw she was, at that point, that was pretty advanced. But it goes from the very beginning, like the early stage, or the detection of it, through to that end stage. Um, so the, everyone in the family was affected, in a, I believe, in very real life ways. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, um, yes, I didn't explain that. Thank you for bringing that up. The question was, how do you get the photonovela? I brought a few copies. I believe they've probably already been distributed. Um, be, uh, but you can access it online by going to the National Alzheimer's Association website. So it's www.alz.org. And it will have, uh, it has portals or resources in different languages. So there's you know, Chinese, there's um, Spanish, um, I forget how many languages there are, I think there's three or four, I think Korean is up there now. So there's several languages in, uh, and it's under that section, it's in that section of materials in Spanish, even though it's in Spanish and English, but it's downloadable from that section. Um, it won't come out in color unless you have a color printer. Um, so if you happen to have a color printer, it, I think it's more effective because it is colorful, um, but not everyone has that, you know. But if you do, I, I would say print it on a color printer. We also have with it, it, also downloadable from that same website, is a facilitator's guide. So any of you that run support groups with Spanish-speaking caregivers might find the facilitator's guide handy. Uh, we developed that after the project because a lot of people that we gave the fotonovela to, they said, well, what do I do with it? You know, I mean, if they were professionals, if they were family members, they knew what to do. But if they were professionals, they weren't sure, you know, how do I use this? What, can, what should I do with it? So we developed that guide, uh, what, we were, what, what each page is, or each section is about, and how you, know, how you could use it to facilitate discussion in a group. Um, even if everyone didn't have a copy, it doesn't matter, you could still use the, the ideas. Um, and that's been well received by professionals, so that's also on the website. That um, project was funded by the Alzheimer's Association, 
national office. So that's why they're, I think that's part of why they're allowing it up on their website and promoting it. No, that you would need to contact me for. Um, so there's my contact information. I'll um, be happy to send you copies of the different papers.